Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast, Episode 117. Wireless LAN Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless LANs. This Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless LAN veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless LAN professionals by wireless LAN professionals. Welcome to this week's Wireless LAN Professionals podcast. Uh, my name is Keith Parsons, and today I'm with uh, Heather Mo Williams. So, Heather, how are you? I am just fine. Thank you so much. Well, we can't let that go. So, what's the Mo for? <laughs> Um, there were multiple Heathers, and uh, my grandfather's call sign in the uh, in, in the Navy was Mo. And somebody came up with the idea because the other Heather had curly hair, so it fulfills all of the requirements. It got assigned to me. I hated it, and uh, I've just sort of at, at some point you have to just own it. And that, now you're stuck with it. So there we go. Thanks, Mo. Um, just just so the listeners know, to get a, a visual of, I mean, it's it's a podcast. We only have audio. We don't have all the nice visual things. Can you describe where you are and what you see right now? I'm well, setting you up, actually, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah. So because I live in uh, very rural East Texas, uh, the best uh, for the audio quality, the best place is actually on my back porch. So I am facing uh, the lake where the bass fishermen have uh, begun heating up and the great blue herons are coming in. So I have obviously a very difficult and stressful view. Oh, that's that's so tough. Um, but this happens to be a week that has been stressful for many people in the industry. Uh, we happen to be recording this the week the crack came out. Um, I happen to be reading an article that you uh, posted up on the Ruckus Room. Uh, you work for Ruckus, solution engineer for the global, what a name, global field sales enablement. It's just like a fancy way of saying pre-sales? Uh, it's a fancy way of saying we uh, pulled some words out of a hat and picked the ones that sounded uh, more important. Well, let's so we're on our... the engineering. <laughs> we're, on, we're actually not on the sales side. We're on the engineering side. But I like to say if we're doing our job, we're making the field job easier. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Plus, it lets you have a seven-word uh, title. You know, not everyone gets those. So, well, well done. Oh, there you go. So, Crack came out this week, um, and there is a lot of hype. I, I like your quote, and the, and the title of your article is "Keep Calm and Wi-Fi On." So, you have some some experience, and what I'd originally thought we'd talk about was the presentation you did at. Uh, Wi-Fi Trek on, you know, your your Black Hat experience, but that kind of dovetails right into to this whole crack vulnerability. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. This exploit's called crack. Uh, what is it, and how's it? How, you know, why should people be worried or not worried? Um, well, they shouldn't be worried, and uh, and you're you're quite right. We all had intentions of what we were going to be doing this week, and for me. Um, about Sunday mid-morning, I started reconsidering exactly the way things were going to go. So uh, the crack, uh, and I think it's a, it, that's a really good name because it's not that anything's broken or um, uh, that even that it, there's, it's terribly dangerous exploit, but it is a, I, I believe that the hype or the reaction to it has been more around the fact that something that we always took for granted as being safe and secure had a fissure um, exposed, if you will. So there's a little bit of a, a, a crack in the armor. Um, so something, any, nothing's worse than the thing that you think is absolutely the one thing that can't be broken. Um, and so what it is is just an exploit of the uh, four-way handshake between a client and an access point. And um, as usual, there was a way to induce bad behavior or unexpected and, and unanticipated behavior. Uh, mostly on the on the client side that can expose um, in in very rare circumstances and really at this point only in the lab environment um, some of the data of uh, from the from the client side on the surface I can see where people would hit the panic button because it looks like I think at first glance I think a lot of people looked at it and said oh my goodness AES is, has been cracked AES is broken. And that's absolutely not the case. And it's it's not even to the AES stage. Um, so four-way handshakes happen with both PSK and .1X. So is this uh, is either one more vulnerable than the other? 
Uh, no, because it doesn't have anything to do with either the PSK or the uh, .1X. I think that that was one of the problems is that .1X has been considered the gold standard, and if you have that in place, then nothing else can go wrong. And so what this showed was even when you're done with the .1X, there is a I, – I don't want to get into all the, the crazy acronyms, but there's a key that mm -hmm. comes from the radio server – and then you have to have a four-way handshake to exchange those. And so what, what it actually is the, the flaw, or would you call it a fissure, a crack? Well, so, yeah, yeah the, the, the nick in the armor, if you will. So it, here's the thing. Um, the reason why uh, the Americans were able to break the, uh, the codes for the Russians coming out of the embassy in Washington in the 1950s is because they were using one-time keypads. You use the keypad, you throw it away, you never use it again. There is absolutely no way to crack that. Um, and what the Soviets were doing, uh, some of the workers were pretty lazy, and they were just reusing the keypad. Um, and for that reason, we were able to read just about everything that was coming out of there. It's not even close to that, but in a similar sense. So we're using a, they're, they've been able to induce behavior on the client side that reuses the same key. Um, with the same packet number. And so now all of the variables are known, and so reverse engineering to decrypt a packet um, becomes possible for as many packets as gets repeated, which in the, in the Wi-Fi world, one second is a long time, but one second of data is, and, and in the lab, maybe as much as 19 seconds, depending on the equipment that's being used. Um, that's a lot of data, but in the end, um, because this is an attack against an individual client or even possibly a couple of clients at a time, unless you've done some pretty serious whaling, um, so you're doing not just spear fishing, but you've, you've, uh, you're not just going to pick up, you know, Aunt Nancy at Starbucks. You're, you, you've got to be, in order to get something useful out of this, you would have had to have done some significant uh, other network breaches to identify who your, your target was and or social engineering. So that you you know who's who's traffic to uh, to target, and in an enterprise environment where you've got a lot of noise in the air, um, I question um, how realistic that the value of that tra uh, traffic would be. And one of the things that uh, that I've read other other articles about this is uh, they they make it sound like oh it's just a man in the middle attack, and they they turn that into MITM, you know, just a short thing that you kind of forget about. What what does that mean to to be in you know we've used man in the middle on wired before but in a wireless sense how can you how can someone be in the middle right and that's also a, a, another good point because and we'll talk about that in, in just a second but one of the things that I think can be good that comes out of this is that it focuses on the dangers of actual high value uh, hacks that involve man in the middle and so the more that we as an industry can react or maybe even pivot and say this, these are the things that we really should be looking at, um, I think would be good. And it, so it is good to note that on the client side, in order for this hack to even be possible, you do have to have a man in the middle, um, which requires that the bad actor be um, on site. So this isn't going to be something that's going to be happening from, um, from Russia into your network. Uh, remotely, so somebody has to be there in in the network, and be uh, with ha hardware that's acting and uh, spoofing the access point you think that you're connecting to, um, and some other pretty sophisticated software. So you've actually got somebody who's broadcasting the SSID or the wireless LAN that the client tries to attack uh, to associate to, and you've got um, this hardware that that's intercepting the packets in between both the client and the access point. So one of the terms that, that we've been throwing around is man in the middle. When you think of wireless, does that mean that the man in the middle attack has to physically be between the client device and the access point? <laughs> well, mean, wherever the air the is. It, um, in, in, uh, from an RF point of view, um, right. So uh, you, uh, could it be someone who's on the sidewalk with a, uh, with a high-gain antenna? Um, so from he, physically, the bad actor may not be sitting between you and your barista, and I'm picking on Starbucks right now, even though we know that's not a, a network that's even um, vulnerable to this. But um, but from an RF point of view, it means that the the signal strength is coming is is between is higher between you and the access point. 
Good. Thanks for that extra explanation. Uh, sometimes when other people uh, talk about things, they, they, they visualize something that doesn't actually have to be true. So, All right. You, and that can lead to some misunderstandings. So that was a good clarification. Yeah. Uh, another thing you mentioned was uh, you need to eliminate R. So what, how, how come R, Adotilvan R, has a vulnerability? So the R vulnerability actually has more to do with the, the, the only one um, of the 10 vulnerabilities that got uh, announced with this. The only one that where we're actually inducing the uh, doing something to the access point. Now, still the client who's just performing the bad behavior, he's reusing uh, or reinstalling a, a, a key and reusing the same packet numbers. But it's not because anything happened to the cli to the client. It's because the uh, access point was triggered, and it has to do with when you're um, when the client is roaming from one access point to the next. And so the fast transition that takes place, that's um, aided by the 11R uh, protocol, is what allows. Uh, it, 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 it's those messages that are being exchanged during that fast transition that is, is that's actually the um, the vulnerability. So any access point that is is not supporting 11R um, by definition is now not vulnerable to that one um, to that one um, uh, CDE. So what's you know. You've been at Black Hat for a couple of years now and done theirs. Any reason why this wasn't announced uh, back at a, either a Black Hat or a, uh, <laughs> you know, oh, it, it, it was. It was okay. It was, so. and this, and 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 I hate to say this um, because I, I I don't like to paint too too big of a picture of it, but this year's Black Hat Network, the the Wi-Fi, which was almost it, 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 almost all of the traffic went across the Wi-Fi as opposed to previous years where it, 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 most of it had gone across the wire. Um, the phrase that I used in hushed tones until towards the end of the conference was boringly stable. Um, so we, ha we actually had a, a great conference. We, we pushed a lot of traffic. We had almost n none in terms of complications, and there's, no, there's never none. But we had, uh, it was just a, a really nice, relaxing event comparatively. Um, and so I actually got to go see some of the briefings. I have never been able to, I've always been running, you know, about 20 miles a day, <laughs> maintaining the network and, and checking um, on connectivity. Um, so I ducked out to go see the one briefing that had Wi-Fi in the name. I had no idea what it was. I took pictures of it and I even spoke to the presenter um, afterwards. And the presentation made it very clear that this was of academic interest, and as far as his team had been able to determine, there was absolutely no practical application. And I, I actually talked to people about it at uh, at the Wi-Fi Trek uh, conference last uh, yeah, last the, week. Yeah, the, the week before it was announced, even so, months before. Well, yeah, it, it was talked about at Black Hat a week before you talked to but, with people at Wi-Fi Trek, and then it, it, not only sudden, that, but if you read. Right. If you if you go to his website that where that where the uh, link went live on uh, for us on Monday morning, um, or when we woke up, the uh, at the very bottom he, uh, there's a paragraph about how did you notify and when did you notify people. Um, the uh, the two vendors of access points that he tested initially back um, uh, in the spring, early summer. Um, he notified that those two vendors two weeks before Black Hat. And then it was also talked about at Black Hat. So this whole uh, sky is falling is, is kind of just marketing hype. I think that there's a number of things. I've actually been wondering about that. I think that the, the truth is that there have been a number of fairly horrific attacks, um, not Wi-Fi related at all, but horrific uh, attacks um, that just this year. And I did speak about that a little bit at Wi-Fi Trek. Um, and I think that may have primed the pump. The mainstream media, the mainstream people, if not just mainstream IT people, non-infosec people, are now starting to look around and realize um, that uh, ignorance is not bliss. Between the Petya and not Petya, the fact that we now no longer have to know about ransomware, but we have to be concerned about wiperware, um, something that looks like ransomware but is, in fact, um, encrypted in such a way that you will never, uh, they don't even bother with the key. Um, so the attack is, is completely um, uh, malicious uh, with no way to retrieve it. But these are the kinds of things that got introduced to us this year. Um, and it's, um, and so I think that, that, that it, it, it uh, 
made people maybe more hyper aware. And so when you add to that, that the, the things like the not touch and the wiperware attacks happened for the most part overseas, for the most part it affected um, industries. Um, the average person could say, wow, that was bad. It doesn't touch me. But as soon as you touch someone's Wi-Fi, I defy you. Who doesn't use Wi-Fi? I live in the middle of nowhere, East Texas. Um, I may be the only person that can say uh, most of the people I know don't use Wi-Fi. But the honest truth is that most people don't know when they're using Wi-Fi or not using Wi-Fi. And so and I think that it, 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 it allowed the panic to sort of seep in. And panic did seep in. But I, I think most people were uh, not in the Ben Miller camp. Ignore it. Don't even talk about it. It's not even an issue to over, you know, stop using Wi-Fi altogether. And I think the, the bulk of us are, are someplace in between. I yes, think, there's an yes, issue. And I would, uh, right. And I, I will say this, that I was particularly pleased at what I will call some of the most irresponsible coverage that I saw. The fact that you had major news outlets referring to this as the internet um, EMP, um, I thought was th that, that kind of hyperbole served absolutely no purpose yeah, other sells, than to sells papers. Uh, almost, almost, yeah, I was going to say clickbait other than that. Um, it, yeah, and I would also like to point out that thing, the, it's, all, it's all about clicks now. Right. I would also like to point out that the general reaction to, um, you, you mentioned the, the blog that I've uh, published. Um, the general reaction among people who know me well um, will tell you that's the kind of bizarro world we live in these days, that if I'm the one who's the voice of reason, <laughs> the world really is. That's the thing that maybe people should be more concerned about than, than crack. So well, was uh, reasonable. Oh, dear. So not, not that you are the representative for Ruckus, but how's Ruckus reacted to this? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I speak for myself. I, I uh, know that we're um, working very hard to uh, make sure that every all of the um, uh, bars and customers' uh, concerns are addressed. And uh, so, what's it take to 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 get over this as an industry? Uh, you know, I I hate to say this, but the next distraction. And and, and it could be anything. I'm not talking about within Wi-Fi. I'm not talking about crack version two. Um, just the next thing that, that comes up that I takes just, the top of mind. It, it, you know what? In today's in, uh, society, it's almost like we're all distracted by shiny squirrels. So, so um, and, and it could be thing. the next infosec thing, the next shiny object, the next squirrel that runs past your um, uh, path. But uh, no, I mean, I think that this is, and this is the part that I think that there's two. But there's a negative and there's a, a way to make this into a positive. One of the things that I saw the infosec industry um, maybe most perturbed about with crack was first it was interesting to them. And then when they realized um, that it was interesting in an esoteric manner, uh, what they were most concerned about is the amount of energy that was sapped away from the real honest to goodness security concerns. So uh, engineers are dropping everything to address this that might or might not be a real thing, but meantime, we have a list of CVEs that um, are really particularly concerning. Um, fishing and spear phishing in particular, I know, are um, the bane of um, their existence these days for the average sysadmin. Um, and so anything that takes away from from what the real dangers are is, um, is, is creating a, uh, more of a problem. But we have, this is a good opportunity also. Because like I said, we, we, we talked about um, this particular um, crack requires a man in the middle attack. So what, as an industry, how can we react to do better? What can we do better to deal with um, those attacks? Because um, network infrastructure um, is far more vulnerable to man in the middle on the average. Um, that, and that has nothing to do with crack. And uh, to a certain extent, doesn't even really have anything to do with Wi-Fi. But dealing with those kinds of attacks, where um, they just it, just in the last 12 months, we've seen um, this is the man in the middle attacks are helping um, move the spear phishing into the whaling campaign, uh, where they're targeting the CEOs, the CTOs, the CFOs of companies fairly um, scarily effectively in some cases. And that doesn't really even need Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi might be the transport, but that's it's not a Wi-Fi attack. Correct. Correct. And in some cases, it's 
uh, it's just some really excellent social engineering attacks. Humans are always the weakest ones, right? Yeah, but you, you can't get money for that. It's hard, it's hard to get budget to do in-house security personnel training. Uh, that's, that, that, that's true. and It's, it's, yeah. it's not uh, a but thing you can buy. Um, you, you can't install, um, say, please install social awareness that we won't have any of these attacks. Right. And t- until we get uh, USB drives in the back of our heads, I'm not sure how to, to better um, to better deal with that. But it is interesting. At every Black Hat that I've been to, they uh, they do training classes before the actual conference. One of the classes that sells out first and fastest is always the social engineering aspect. Um, there are always attacks that don't involve um, that require some fairly uh, sophistication, but most attacks at some point are going to require um, a break in the human link. And so social engineering tends to be um, really very important. So your recommendations for just some average sysadmin doing Wi-Fi is, you know, maybe 10% of their job. What should they do ab- about this crack? And- um, well, what their CTO tells them to do, right? Um, the, the most important thing is to make sure that the client devices get patched. And I know that on, uh, you can look on GitHub to see uh, the vendor reactions and, and see where we are with that. Um, the nice thing is the iOS devices are uh, 100% patched. So we're looking at, at, at really it's the Android devices and the IoT. And so getting the client devices patched um, as soon as possible is going to be key. Well, and, and just, I mean, going back in history from web, web cracking and other types of uh, wireless attacks, if someone has an IoT device and it's running PSK and it does a four-way handshake and if, 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 if all these ifs lay it out in place, someone does them in the middle, do they get the ability to listen in on all wireless traffic? And that's an important distinction. This, uh, this attack really is client-based. So if they do all of those things, it means that the traffic from that client to the access point is vulnerable. The traffic so, between the client and the access point, is, and, and only that client, there is absolutely no network um, infrastructure that is, um, that is vulnerable at that point. So if we're slow in getting our IoT devices, maybe someone could find out what the temperature of my fridge was. Well, there is that, and I've been meaning to tell you about that, your uh, ice cream smoking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, and yeah, you'd have to but, be uh, on site uh, to even get uh, that. You know, sometimes yeah, so I now you know I'm lying because I already told you I'm in East Texas, so I'm fine. Yeah, so it's, it's something you can't even do remotely to pull those things off. Um, no, you can't. And 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 you're right. And now it's also important to note that the client traffic is vulnerable or is is apt for decryption, but only if it's also not going across a correctly configured. SSL, HTTPS, VPN kind of connection. And so um, it, you're really having to thread the needle. But it, it makes more, it's a bigger bang if you can say we can replicate it in a lab. Oh, absolutely. Because that's the basis of all science. Hey, they could replicate it and we could do it in a lab. So therefore, yeah. I mean, being able to repeat a, a, an experiment. And it's also a lot sexier to say the sky is falling. And so uh, any reactions to your keep calm and Wi-Fi on? I mean, you, you posted that. I, don't, I haven't seen if, if you get reactions off of that, um, the the reactions that I've gotten um, have been uh, and both internally and then, uh, but more importantly, externally have been, um, oh, thank goodness, finally. And like I said, the voice of reason. At which point, I really got concerned about the state of the world. Um, but that overwhelmingly, that has been um, the. Um, and, and and I'll be honest, I got the idea for the subtitle of the blog because somebody from somebody else um, who uh, published a and I and I wish I could oh it was a uh, it was an infosec um, expert he's an, an infosec uh, architect and his um, his blog came out uh, just ahead of mine and the first thing I thought is there's nothing so uncommon as common sense which is a great quote from Benjamin Franklin. And that's why the subtitle of my quote is, an, a, you know, a common sense approach to an uncommon problem. It's, a, it's going to be a very, very rare problem, but let's just apply some common sense to this. Well, good, good, good advice for all. And so where would someone find you if they're looking for you on the webs? I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, No Better Wi-Fi. And your uh, Ruckus Room blog, do you have the URL for that? I actually uh, don't have that uh, Memorized, right? Well, I do. It's theruckusroom.ruckuswireless.com. 
the ruckus room ruckus wireless.com and we'll have those up in both of those up in the show notes uh feel free to follow heather mo better wi-fi uh by the way uc says hi i was just talking a little while ago and he goes, <laughs> oh you're talking to mo tell mo hi for me so now yeah, online, make sure you tell people everyone. to follow me at the now <laughs> make sure you tell everybody to follow me at their own discretion i don't come with much of a filter uh, that's okay. We like no filters. So thanks for your time today, Heather, and uh, good luck with uh, living out there in East Tex- Texas out in the wild. So hopefully you get fast internet sometime in your life. It's coming. I can feel it. It's going to come. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your time. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Wireless Land Blog Reviews with Glenn Kate. Well, Glenn, welcome back to the show. What uh, Wi-Fi blog are we reviewing today? Hey, well, thank you, Matthew. Um, well, we've got a first here for the WLAN Professional Blog Review. Uh, this Wi-Fi podcast is reviewing another Wi-Fi podcast. Cool. And uh, this website is uh, Clear to Send, and you can find it at cleartosend.net. Uh, the two hosts of the show is uh, Roel Dionisio. You can find Roel at, at Roel Dionisio. Uh, spell his name out there. And uh, he's got a co-host, uh, Francois Verger. Uh, and he's at, at Verger's Francois. Uh, you can look them up on Twitter and search, and you can find their Twitter handles. Uh, Roel works at a, as a network engineer in higher education in Southern California. And Francois is the owner of a Wi-Fi VAR in Ontario, Canada. And uh, you can also follow Clear to Send with that Twitter handle as well as at Clear to Send. Uh, both Francois and Roel are CWNEs, and they bring their expertise and love of Wi-Fi into this podcast. And I really like the, the stuff that they're doing. Uh, Roel started out a few years ago, and uh, he tells on his website he wanted to do a weekly Wi-Fi blog as a goal to help kind of give back to the Wi-Fi community because he had learned so much from the community and uh, wanted to design a podcast dedicated to wireless networking. Um, He also wanted to help engineers who were just kind of starting out wireless and uh, provide some tips and tools that he had learned and uh, wanted to give that back to the community. Uh, By the way, I think all WLAN engineers out there uh, know that Clear to Send is a frame that is used to enhance the virtual carrier sense process and clear to send definitely enhances the wireless community and enhances it a lot. Um, now, what I really like about his website is they've got, uh, there's just so many very topics in Wi-Fi and I really like what Roel and Francois do. They cover a lot of different topics. Uh, for example, I've got the website uh, list up on my MacBook here, and uh, they include uh, some different topics, the road to CWNE, uh, Wi-Fi in warehouses, Wi-Fi security, Cisco Mobility Express, how to do a Wi-Fi validation, and they've even got a couple of podcasts on their website here uh, from different Wi-Fi engineers in a roundtable format. And that's kind of neat to hear what other engineers are doing as well. Um, there's just a lot of varied topics they have. So I would just suggest taking a look at the topic list, download five or so. Next time you have to take a long trip, like to uh, the other side of the country or something of, of that nature, and uh, you can have some great Wi-Fi podcast listening on your flight. Um, you can also subscribe to Clear to Send in iTunes as well. That's right. Uh, anything we don't want to miss. Well, uh, Roel and Francois have a tab called Ask a Question, and they seriously want to hear from the WLAN community about topics that they would like to, you, you would like to see covered on, on the Clear Descent podcast. So, that's a t- so if there's a topic that you want to know about, um, what's been beating you in the brain for a few weeks, let's say, uh, put it on the response box at the Clear Descent website and uh, know about it and get a podcast started on that topic. Uh, also, if you've never participated in a podcast, uh, let them know about it. Maybe you've got an area of expertise that you've worked at and you want to give back to the Wi-Fi community as well. I know Roel and Francois have asked me to come on a couple of times with their podcasts. And um, so I've enjoyed doing that. And I feel that's a, a great way to give back to the community. So take a shot at it about being interviewed and being on your own podcast. Um, I, I just my thanks to Roel and Francois for this awesome podcast, Clear to Send. A lot of people are doing it. A lot of people are listening to it. And uh, that is cleartosend.net. Go ahead, subscribe to that on iTunes, and be sure to check out and download some of their products and all their podcasts, rather. And uh, you'll have those for your next road trip. Very cool. Well, um, and we can follow you, Glenn, on Twitter. 
Yes, at GRKate, and I'd love to follow you back. I'd love to follow all the Wi-Fi professionals out there. Um, if I know your Twitter handle, I'll be sure to follow you back. Very good. Well, this is Matthew. And this is Glenn Kate reminding all of you Wi-Fi professionals out there to keep on blogging in the free world. Bye for now. WLAN Interview. Welcome back to Wireless Land Professionals Podcast. I'm here with uh, Ferney Munoz. Uh, Ferney, uh, you just got back from where? Mexico City, sir. And what was going on in Mexico? Uh, Aruba Atmosphere, a regional uh, section of their uh, atmosphere, and uh, that was like one of the biggest ones they've had uh, for a regional one. And how, how big was it? Well, I thought it was going to be like, you know, <coughs> two or three hundred people big, but that's, it was that's a large one. Well, it was over 1,200 people big. It is, was. Is this like for all of Latin America or just for Mexico? Well, it was supposed to be like uh, for Mexico only, but uh, there were some representatives from other places in Latin America there. Uh, I was surprised. I was thinking, you know, a couple hundred people and uh, you know, a huge venue at the Hyatt Regency in, uh, in Polanco in a, in a nice area in Mexico City. And uh, yeah, there were over a thousand people there. I was quite impressed. Uh, very impressive. And what were you doing there? Uh, I was invited. I've been uh, doing some work with the Aruba guys, and uh, I got the invitation a while ago. It was I thought it was going to be uh, canceled or postponed because of the earthquake, uh, but it wasn't. You know, earthquake just happened a couple of weeks prior to that. There was there were a lot of uh, as I was driving around, noticed a lot of damage on the buildings in the city, and uh, and yeah, they were kind of skeptical about it. But it took place, and I went to visit with friends and, and colleagues and other wireless professionals and met a new met a lot of new people. Curdy was there, the the CEO and uh, it was quite a big show. Quite a big show. It was not just Yeah, they they definitely put on a big show. Uh, yeah, their keynotes are some of the best I've ever seen. Yes, there were some interesting ones, and uh, it just it was a one day event. Uh, I haven't been to any of the atmospheres before. It was my first one, so it was quite impressive. Nice, really nice show at the beginning. Nice uh, showman at the end, and you know meals uh, included, and uh, everything was just very professionally recorded, and lights and everything was just amazing. So it was more of a, a one day regional event. I've been to a couple of these with maybe you know a couple hundred people. But twelve hundred—that's a—that's definitely a big event, uh, all in Spanish. Yes, sir. Well, uh, of course, Curdy. Curdy, how do you say his Curti, name? Curdy. Yeah. Uh, no, he w it was in English, but they had some uh, devices that were provided for people that didn't speak English to uh, do like a translation. Like live? Live so, translation, yeah. So they were wearing kind of like what, what those devices they give you when you go on tours. That they give you a device and, and, and headphones oh, so you, you, and, somebody you else, like it, yeah. and somebody else was tra translating simultaneously. Uh, so was that in all the sessions or just characters? No, just him. And uh, there was the uh, one of the global SE managers, Austin, he was there. And he also uh, supported Curti on the on the presentation and doing some live demonstrations. Actually, very impressive. And that was the only thing that was in English. Other than that, uh, all the other presenters and the shows and everything uh, were in Spanish. Good. Well, what did you learn there? How was your experience? Uh, well, being uh, my first atmosphere, I was impressed by the amount of people and the professionalism that the the whole event uh, took. Um, I learned. Uh, that uh, you know, Aruba is taking a lot of uh, growth, seeing a lot of growth in Latin America. And yes, I've experienced some of this. We had our first uh, wireless land professional conference in Bogota in Spanish only. Uh, and I know there is a huge potential. In large I, re I remember market. that. I just don't remember <laughs> what anyone said, but I remember that they spoke in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, that's a, a market that we have eyes on and we just want to bring the community together as we have done it in the U.S. and Europe and other places in the world. And uh, I, being from Colombia and being Latin American myself, I kind of felt and still feel that Latin America is a market that is kind of being neglected, kind of being left on the side, kind of like underestimated. But there is huge potential there and uh, all the growth and all the uh, the expansion that all these companies are seeing is tremendous. So I learned uh that uh, the growth that Aruba is seeing and experiencing there is also the growth that other industries are seeing, other companies in, in the wireless industry are seeing. And um, I think a lot of people are seeing the potential in the region and they're kind of investing more in, in training and doing events of this uh, sort to bring the community together. 
Well, um, unlike Europe, where English is the de facto standard, so when we hold a WLPC in Europe, it's, all the sessions are in English. In Latin America, it's more of a Spanish-speaking, only some people speak English. That is correct, yes. Uh, English, even though we learn it as a second language, is not at the level that will have you uh, understanding you know, the, the technical conversation that we usually have. So there is a bigger effort on the people to understand you know, a, a, a conversation or a, a presentation in, in English only. Well, you, you, you teach, obviously you're uh, bilingual, speak both languages very well. What, what did it take to translate like the CWNA into Spanish or the ECSE classes you teach? Uh, well, initially, I was going to start translating uh, the slides and, and kind of uh, putting together the whole presentation in Spanish. But I decided that since the exams are in English anyway, the terms are in English and the whole thing is in English. So I decided to leave the slides as they are. And I have to do kind of like a translate on the fly and also explain the concept in Spanish. So going from English to Spanish, uh, it was actually very hard because there are many words that uh, I had to learn. And I, depending on the audiences that I have, if they're from uh, different Spanish-speaking countries, because even though Latin America, we all communicate in Spanish, we all have different dialects. For instance, the word survey. We're all familiar with it. And some of us hate it. Yes. And uh, it's misused and, and stuff. But here's the thing. Like uh, in Mexico, they use the word levantamiento. Levantamiento is like to raise something. But levantamiento is one of the words they use for a survey. In Colombia, levantamiento is when somebody gets killed and murdered. Then they send the uh, police to do forensic uh, investigations and raise the body. So that same word levantamiento in Colombia means something different. So they call that. You know, it's the same word, but it has totally different meanings. You probably want, wouldn't want to use that for doing an on-site. We're coming on-site to do this. <laughs> yeah, levantamiento. And then people are like, who died? Like, nobody. We're just going to do a study of the wireless environment. So the same thing happens with, like, drywall. You know, we've talked about it. I had in that presentation in Phoenix about, you know. Drywall, sheetrock, sh yeah. jetboard. Yeah. yeah. So they call it um, tabla roca. In Mexico, they call it a paneles de yeso in Colombia, and they call it pladur in Spain. So now we're adding uh, Spain also to this uh, event because And then Spanish. you also taught in Brazil. Yes, and, and there we do it in, in English. But, of course, you know, they have a, a large uh, understanding of the Spanish language, so I kind of try to mix it uh, all so it makes sure everybody understands what we're talking about. Well, you also have a podcast in Spanish. Yes, sir. I haven't been this, very this active. This is my <laughs> reminder to tell you you should be doing more. I know. I haven't been very active lately, but uh, I, I I promise I have I have so much in the queue that I just have to make time for it. it that podcasting does take time. It does take time, but uh, I think it has. I had a good feedback on it. Uh, a lot of people uh, enjoying the uh, the bringing the community in Latin America together the same way we're doing it in Europe and the U.S. So, it, it, it there's a lot of work, but there's uh, also uh, interest in people joining the community and, and providing and helping uh, bring it together. Well, uh, I was impressed in Bogota, though I didn't understand this, the discussions how much energy there was in the community itself that people just want to hang out and be together and we sourced all of the content was local and provided well except for phil yeah phil came from uh new zealand which to bogota <laughs> and spoke in a second language and presented very well so he, yeah he's a actually very good spanish speaker i was impressed and actually, uh, you know, the of the videos that have been uploaded, I think he has the most views on his presentation. And he's not even a native speaker. Well, yes. what else did you see down in uh, Mexico that you want to comment on? Um, the <clears throat> the need for training. I talked to many people that they're just so interested in getting more training. They're like, well, when are you you're gonna bring like wireless land professionals bring classes here specifically in Mexico or, or in Spanish only? Just like training is a is a large market and uh, 
it's also that uh, hungry for knowledge that everybody has. You know, uh, because we speak another language doesn't mean that we're not interested in wireless lands, and uh, that doesn't mean that we don't understand them. I mean, there are a lot of people with a lot of knowledge and a lot of challenges. They are designing wireless networks in these huge buildings and stadiums, no different than stadiums in the U.S. and Europe. They have the same needs and the same lack of uh, expertise that we see throughout the world. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that things like uh, Aruba's atmosphere are growing and building a, a bigger content down there. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll schedule our next WOPC down in Latin America, probably Mexico, right? Yes, sir. We're thinking uh, Monterey. So that's, that's a, a, a place we have in sight. And uh, I've never been there, but uh, I understand it's a very big city, one of the you know second, probably the second biggest and most important city in uh, in Mexico, and uh, most likely it's going to take place there. And the feedback we received in Bogota was uh, Mexico probably have a little better draw, easier to get to than Colombia. Yes, and uh, well, I I noticed that some some of the guys uh, were kind of like scared, like oh, is it dangerous down there, like. No, it's not. I mean, you were there. We went downtown I'd, looking for some adapters, and you know. I didn't. I didn't have any, any trepidation or fear walking around Bogota, other than the one you have when you don't understand. What you're, if you can't eavesdrop on people around you, there's a little like, oh, I don't belong here. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, but we travel anyway. Yeah, we travel. You know, go to all kind of places throughout the world. So yeah, no, it's not dangerous. Uh, same thing in Mexico. Some people are like, oh, 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 what's happening there? Like nothing's happening there. It's just you know. Another big city with millions of people living don't, there. Don't do drug deals. Yeah, just depends what you're going to be doing down there. You're going to get in trouble or not. Yeah. Well, good news. Uh, th- thanks for the information on uh, on the atmosphere in Mexico City. And we will hear from you on your uh, Spanish WN yeah. Pros podcast. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless Land Professionals Podcast. The podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless Land Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi. 